So we are here to present uh, our package that hopefully will be completely done by the end of the year. But right now we are on the development phase yet, uh, development phase still. Uh, this package was, was developed by me, Lucio, and like it's a package that took many years and many ideas and many versions to, to come up. But we have already some published data that uses it. But the, the main idea of the package is to interpret RNA-seq, bulk RNA-seq results at isoform level. So what is a generic transcriptome analysis for bulk RNA-seq? So you get your FASTQ files from the facility or from the, the ones that you did yourself. You do an alignment against the genome or you do a pseudo alignment against the transcriptome and you do a differential expression at the gene level. And then you do a geoterms, like you do a functional enrichment or you do a volcano plot to show off specific genes. This is the most generic bulk RNA-seq analysis and it works very well for gene level. If you want to see the, the results of the expression of a single gene between two conditions, it works very well. The biggest problem is like this analysis, it, uh, it kind of, how can I say, it hopes that uh, one thing is happening, that your genomic region is being transcribed into per-mRNA the per-mRNA is suffering splicing into mRNA into a mature mRNA, and this mature mRNA is turning into a protein. And we know that it's not exactly that that happens. We have a much more biological variability on the splicing point, and not just on the splicing, but also on how the RNA polymerase 2 transcribes, starts and stops transcribing different transcripts. So in real, what happens is that uh, you have a genomic region. If you look them at the gene level, that's what you're going to see. That genomic region suffers during splicing, can produce protein coding transcripts, that transcripts that have the start codon, the end codon, and only exons, but they can also produce unproductive transcripts. Here we call unproductive anything that cannot be translated by canonical translation methods. Pretty much there are like two biggest unproductive uh, groups, the processed transcript that lost the ORF in some, in some way. It can be because of introns, can be because of the loss of a start of RM codon. And then MD is because they have a premature stop codon near the splicing junction. And these transcripts are marked for the NMD mechanism, the nonsense mediated decay mechanism to be degraded, degraded. And the problem about that is that like we have a very, a very big range of transcripts. And when you analyze them as only gene level, you're losing a lot of information. All right, I, told, I tell that, but uh, is there any meaningful impact of not analyzing a transcript level for a clinician or for a clinical results? So there's a very good, example that's actually a textbook example and is related to the VGFR or FLIT1, the VGF receptor. Because on normal conditions, what happens? Well, the VGF, VGFA connects to the receptor, it gets phosphorylated and it activates two types of cascades, the P3K AKT cascades and the ERK cascades. And these cascades are going to activate proliferation, survival, and angiogenesis inside the cells. What the problem is, this is not the only protein that is related to the VGF region. This is only the 201 transcript. FLIT has many, many transcripts, six of them being protein coding. What happened is that uh, when you have an, an, a FLIT isoform that is not this 201, this flip isoform doesn't have the receptor part. So it sequesters the VGF before connecting to the, to the membrane. And on this cell, you're gonna have less proliferation, less survival and no angiogenesis. In this kind of data, if you did an analysis only at gene level, you would see a lot of VGFR expression. And you were like, wow, but why there's no proliferation or survival in ONG genes? It's pretty much because that isoform is not the isoform that has the receptor. So it doesn't produce the, phen the phenotype associated normally with the receptor. So like, 
what we have today is that a lot of people are doing long reads of a lot of genomes, and we have like a very big variety of isoforms from each from each type of isoform. There's also the long non-code RNA that we are not going to be touching. They are like completely different <laughs> from this. What we're going to be touching today are all the isoforms that can be called unproductive, that they can they are non-coding isoforms processed from coding genes, that the RNA pole transcribes a coding gene, but it becomes an unproductive isoform because of problems of start and end sites or problems of uh, splicing. So one like actual example of published data, it's from the first paper that we use this package. What we did here is that we reanalyzed public data that was SARS-CoV-2 infected uh, A549 cells. And we analyzed that at gene level and at transcript level. These are, this is all public data. So the authors had analyzed first at gene level only, and then we went and did a transcript level expression. If you follow this QR code, you, you can go to the paper. So like, uh, if you look at the analysis at the gene level, this is what you see. This is the, each of the cell types treated, uh, the infected or uninfected with COVID. But if you look at transcript level, you see a very big diversity compared to the gene level because there are multiple types of transcripts. And like, uh, and then you ask yourself, why does it matter? So like, if you have, by example, a retained into transcript related to a gene, that gene is not going to be doing the canonical action of that protein because it's a retained intro. It's not even going to codify a protein in most of the cases. So when we did like a term enrichment separating the productive isoforms and the unproductive isoforms, we found something very interesting. We found that SARS-CoV-2 was upregulating processes on the unproductive sites, processes related to uh, antigen processing and class one M MHC, which means that the virus was itself upregulating unproductive isoforms that would help his in infection to the cell. And the productive isoforms were very focused on the cytokines and chemokine part. If you look here at specific genes, we see like AGLA-B, that's a part of the MHC1 complex. You see that the gene is a little bit upregulated, up but the transcripts that are upregulated are all retained intro. So this is not a canonical form or AGLA-B. And this happens on mostly all the transcripts associated with class 1 MHC complex. So today we're going to produce, uh, present our workflow to do this kind of images. And try to interpret one specific data set at transcript level. So what the workflow needs as input is your differential expression data, your, the latest annotation from gene code. So right now the workflow only works for mice and for human data, unfortunately. It's because to do this type of analysis, you need a very good, well annotated transcriptome. You can't do that on uh, bad annotated transcriptomes. And uh, we decided to do this input using Salmon plus the Gibbs sampling options from Salmon for pseudo alignment because like we did multiple testings with that and we saw that like salmon plus grid sampling it runs well multiple times with the same comment this is like a correlation plot of just salmon versus salmon compared to six independent libraries and also the this bayesian approach to salmon is going to produce technical replicates that are going to be used to switch to compute the differential expression then and uh, Swish is a package that's not much used on the data, but it's a package from the creator of Salmon, Michael Love, and uh, it's a new way to do this differential expression that we found out that for very deep transcriptomes, it works very well. Uh, do we have anything on the chat, Lucio? Not yet, not yet. Not yet, all right. So, at start, 
that we get our gen code annotation and we have a DAT, a DAG RTPM table, and we input that those to the workflow. And from that, we get an output as a first a table that is going to tell you what are the genes that are not that their genes are not differentially expressed, but the transcripts are. These cases are very interesting because this may be cases of isoform switch. And uh, what's isoform switch? Imagine that if it's, there's an isoform that's upregulated and another that's downregulated, when the program computes that at gene level, it's going to sum those TPMs and it's going to negate the gene level. So these, these specific transcripts, they are very interesting for that. We're going to do a visualization of the transcripts using G-ranges. And we're going to do a log to f code change plot of all transcripts of a gene. Also, one thing that it was like uh, our collaborators' idea that became one of the most important parts of the workflow is that uh, we thought uh, in, a, in a very simple way, if a productive isoform affects a pathway, then their productive isoform, the, product, the isoform that doesn't produce proteins is not affecting this pathway. So the idea he had was that he enriched isoforms separately, only the productive and only the productive. So you can see that the GO pathways or the hectone pathways enriched the, separately. And this is the thing that the package does also. And here are some examples from figures directly from the pathway, the, the package without any, any further printing. So this is an RNMT gene, you can see that if you would do a cut, the gene is not differentially expressed. Like it's a little bit downregulated, but it doesn't pass on any of the food change cutoffs. But if you look at the isoforms, there are two isoforms that are expressed. Mm, this is a good question. Uh, Joy asked, is it fair to say transcript is a synonym for isoform? Like that, yeah. Th th that is a thing that I asked myself because isoform is normally a nomenclature that people from the protein side use. Like they do different protein isoforms and different protein biotypes. I kind of prefer the different uh, different uh, expressed transcripts because it, uh, it's related more with the fact that they are transcribed. They are the recently transcribed, but uh, you can also say isoforms, but uh, I would say it can be a synonym. You just ignore the protein part because most of them are not going to produce proteins. Right now, I would say like 70% of all the annotated transcripts from the human genome are unproductive. So you can use both, uh, but like uh, keep in mind that they are not produce, producing proteins. Yeah, that is, that is also a, a really good discussion around the topic that is, um, they can mean different things when you are talking about the actual molecules inside the cell. If you say one transcript being produced in, in the nucleus, then you are talking specifically about one RNA molecule being expressed, like being, being produced in the polymerase. But when you talk about the genome annotation, how, how we interpret what's in the DNA, then isoform is the is, is the be best term to describe one genomic region that produces one RNA molecule, that, that has the potential to produce one RNA molecule. Um, yeah, basically that. Yeah, like uh, I choose this example for you guys because this is a, not a gene that is very known. And also it has like four different proteins annotated on Unipro. And it's the, they are exactly related to the four isoforms that we see here. <laughs> These are the four productive isoforms. So they have different protein coding isoforms, and these isoforms can be related to different uh, phenotypical functions, like on the fleet that one produces a soluble protein and one with, produces a protein with a receptor. Here, when you look at them on the genomic context plot, you see, this is the canonical isoform, the 201, and compared to it, the 202 and the 203. The 202 have a, a downstream site that is included, and the 203 loses a huge part of the first exon. 
And then you see the 209 that loses a small part of the first axon. So you can see that like uh, these, if these are translated, they would produce different proteins. And for the fact that they have complete ORFs, they have the pot potential to be translated. Of course, we can't affirm that they are going to be translated without some specific data set to think about it. So like this was my overall explanation. Then we pass for the hands-on part, just a little bit on the data set that we're going to use. The data set is from this paper from 2020. And I choose the, this data set for two reasons. First reason is um, it's a patient data set and the, they, they have paired case and control patients. This is a data set of um, pregnant women with and without preeclampsia. And these are only the ones that had early onset preeclampsia. So the phenotypes are very well determined. And this data set is very deep. All libraries have over 15 million reads. And for this kind of transcript level analysis, you really need those ki this kind of depth, because if not, when you come to this kind of analysis, it will be like very, the fold chains are gonna be very, very small and you're not gonna, not gonna be very significant. So this data set is very good. Like the paper didn't even try to go to the differential expression side, side of the, this data, but they produced a very good data set. And I choose this one today because I know most of you have a clinician background. So we were working with direct patient data and not cells. So we can pass through the random part, but first I'm gonna stop sharing a bit and I'm gonna see if there is any questions or specific problems in terminology of or, or concepts because like this type of um, What's splicing making? What's an isoform? Or why do isoforms? It's something that needs to be clear before we go to the next steps. So any questions? We hope you didn't scare anyone because this is more molecular biology. Yes, this is very molecular biology. Yeah, more deep in the molecular biology conference can be tricky sometimes and it's yeah. not, not what is and done by default in the, that type of analysis. So yeah. I hope we can at least give an, an overall um, explanation of why or why that would be important or what yeah. how, how you can leverage more deeply that, that kind of analysis. And, and also like uh, um, you can ask me like, why isn't everybody doing transcript level then? I would say like, because uh, we don't have uh, deep data sets and we don't have well annotated transcript tomes to do that. So Joy asked the question, same RNA can result in different transcripts because of random error, or is this important because lots of transcripts don't end up creating problems? That's a very good question. And like uh, our boss in Brazil, she says that it's a way for the cell to subtly regulate itself. So like, there are errors, but there are things that are like favorable to not produce this kind of transcripts because like producing a protein is very costly for the cell. So if she can, so if the cell can itself regulate of producing an unproductive version of that protein is better than changing the entire regulation around the region to just not transcribe. Yeah. Ah, indeed, in, indeed, this is actually a, a frontier in, uh, in the knowledge of biology, actually, that uh, especially in eukaryotic genomes, there is a lot of un unanswered questions on, on why those things happen, why, why, why it wouldn't select to be a, a simpler process. Why, why should we have uh, regulation after the transcription and not before the transcription? That kind of discussion is actually be, being done right now and, and actually changes a lot between organisms. Some organisms prefer to do regulation before transcription, others after. But like Isabella said, the main, the main thing is that's really, if you should take protein as the final product, it's a really costly product for the cells and um that regulation specifically before producing the protein is is one of the most effective one and um and you sh 
shouldn't consider that RNAs are, are, are losing the cell just because of errors, because every step have control even inside the nucleus, after exporting from the nucleus to the cell, the cell has machinery to, to control, mark those RNAs for degradation in different steps. So usually when you find an RNA molecule that can be sequenced, especially in the cytoplasm, it's probably a molecule that already went through several layers of regulation, of processing. And of course, you, you, you can never be sure about, about things, but you, you, you can be really certain that it's an ectoRNA molecule that you identify it in, in the cell and is there for, for some reason. The reason could be just regulation, but, but it, it's there. Yeah. And uh, Zaur asked, uh, what's the sequencing that needed for this level of analysis? It's very discussed, but like I did extensive testing during my master's and pretty much like for gene, gene level, you can pass by using like a 10 million library if you do like patient data set. For transcript level, it's better if you have uh, at least 15 million, 20 million per sample. Because the depth, the most depth if you have, the best you're gonna get the isoforms that are not expressed as much. And for long non coding RNA isoforms, then you need to go for like 20, 30 million. But we're not talking about them today. So, any other questions? You can open the microphone also to ask if you don't mind. Mm. I guess not. Should we move on? So we move on. Do you wanna yeah. get from there? So like- uh... Yeah, we can assume from here. First, I will talk about how to actually use the, the package and then we're going to do like a, an interactive demonstration of what should be expected. Mm -hmm. uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, there we see the git. The, there we see the GitHub. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, um, right. Uh, let me see if I can. I'm coming. I'm using the screen. Yeah, I'm just. I'm gonna the, post the link on the chat. The the zoom, the zoom window separated from the other. Let me increase that a bit. So basically, like, like Isabella said, we are developing this R package based on analysis that we were used to do to answer the question of how can you analyze differential expression data at the isoform level. The, our main goal is not explore um, alternative splicing, not say, oh, we find new isoforms, new, new splicing sites. It's basically trying to get functional interpretation of of why those, those RNAs have been expressed or not. And, and like just interrupting Lucio a bit, the problem about finding new isoforms is that like all the packages that propose to do that, they have like a very small, like they have very small number of hits depending on the condition and the depth. And if you look at the annotation that's produced by long reads, you see a vastly different number of isoforms. So like what we're trying here is trying to use the annotation to interpret things. Thank you for sharing the link. And yeah, basically right now this package is on GitHub. Um, it's being actively, it is still in the development phase. It is still, it, it's still going to be actively developed in, in the next few, few months. There is a bit of a motivation written here. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiarized with the with how the R package development works, but basically, we the, this is all the code for the the project is in that repository. Here we have some example data from some CSV files of the data set we are going to use. I will show how to load it directly using R or or R Studio, 
all the code is here. And usually we write a vignette about doing a, a description of what we do. In this vignette, you have a, a demonstration. Uh, the demonstration we are going to use here is all documented in, in this, this vignette. And also, if you, from the GitHub page, there is also a link here to the, to the rendered version of that GitHub page that is using package down. And this here in the website basically is the same information that you can find on, on, on GitHub, but you also have a rendered version of the, of the vignette. But I will also show how to access that inside R. Um, basically, yeah. So the first thing would be for installing the package, you have to use this, the remotes package. So it has a functionality to install directly from GitHub for packages that are not hosted on, on CRAN or, or Bioconductor, for example. Um, here I'm showing my, uh, my RStudio session. Let me increase my, uh, my hotkey is not bind. Let me increase it a bit. Mm -hmm. no, they are not fine, I guess. I'm yeah. on the small Mac and fine, so. Okay, okay. So um, do, do you guys have any problem with dark teams? Because uh, it's definitely going to be a, a dark one. <laughs> yeah. The first thing you need to do, if you don't have the 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 package installed, the you need to use the remotes package to install install our studio. So you usually do the install package remotes. It's it's the first thing you need to do if you if you don't have it yet. Oops, it's just remote, right? No. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, wait, I'm missing the quotes. Would you? If you don't have it, do a remote. Yeah, it's saying that I already have that and it's loaded. So using remotes, you can do install GitHub. And then you add the, the path to the, the name of the GitHub repository. That is my username, Lucio RQ. And the name of the package is a formic. And we will actually install from GitHub everything that we, we need to use. I don't know if everyone and, here. And is... by everything, we mean the input data set from the, for the preeclampsia analysis and all the functions and all the packages associated with it. Had some dependency errors, error, dependency. Mm -hmm. Oh, the problem is the FGC oh. dependencies. Oh, okay, yeah, I think I haven't added the by default to to look on Bioconductor for the package. You yeah. you you need Bioconductor to install. Um, let's see. Um, we so some of the packages that we depend on they are not available on CRAN, so you need to install them from Bioconductor, and for Just... that you you also need the 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 package BioC Manager. Bioconductor is a is a repository for R packages, basically used on on the life science side of R. And they usually are good quality packages that go through a peer review process before being published, um, and using. In that case, for example, of, of GC, uh, you have to do like library, BioC manager, okay. install. I'm going to glue on chat what you need okay. to do. It's this issue. And then you can install as a formic. Yeah. Um, let me try one thing. For example, if you do BioC manager install, I think if you try to install directly from GitHub using BioC management, I'm not sure if it will install the the also the. I never tried. The yeah, because I know it works directly. It it looks on GitHub for the package, but I'm not sure if it will also find the 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 bioconductor the bioconductor dependencies. But yeah, but basically. Um, but but yeah, like it's pretty, this is a package thing, so like it's yeah. just installing. Then, but FGC and Plot Garden it should stall fast, I guess. Yeah, yeah, they, they are, are not, they are not big. big. 
but may, maybe if the person don't have any bioconductor package installed, they actually bioconductor install a lot of dependencies <laughs> before, so yeah. it can it can take some time for, yeah. actually. But yeah, anyway, so for, like... yeah, yeah. Let, let's move on. Mm -hmm. For loading the package, we we'll just use the library isoformic, and, and our like, all the steps that Lucy is showing are on the vignette. So Lucy, if you want to like glue paste and glue from the vignette, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm just showing the, the doing the initial. Mm -hmm. Let's see, not too late. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I'm gonna. Oh, and we are gonna be presenting this package on the bioconductor conference. By yeah, the way. at least a, a poster. We we want to. No, no, it it's alive. It will give you a, a demo. Also, yeah, it's we, a demo, we are going to be there at the bioconductor conference. Everyone that yeah, we're gonna be is there. Just wanna in, say hi. Yeah, anyone that is interested in bioinformatics and using R for biology, we are going to be there. It's a really nice conference go for it okay but yeah let's oh yeah through yeah you need to install let's just say i am plot gardener just use this oh wait, wait. i didn't post on the chat sorry i post someone i dm'd someone i'm sorry here just use this kinga and it should work install them first then install isoformic and it should be fine yeah i should update the they 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 read me to to talk about the bioconductor dependencies. I we haven't done that. Um, wait, I forgot how to see the vignettes. Wait, 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 wait. I loaded the package. Let's use the help. <laughs> Vignette. Package equal. Package equal. No vignettes found. Yeah. That's a problem. Probably it's not updated yet. Let me open the project. <laughs> I don't know if I handled the, the project, the, the vignette in the install, but if, if you install from GitHub, I think it don't it actually don't handles the 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 vignettes. But inside the if you install from GitHub. Inside the inside the folder, it should have the vignette. Yeah, inside the vignette directly, you have an R markdown file that is the vignette. The, the vignette we are going to use. So we this is the same content that is like I said that is on the website. We are going to follow code chunk by code chunk here and try to explain the kind of input we need and the, and how to actually adapt your data if, if it comes from a different kind of experiment if yeah. if you use you you can you can use different software to do the pre-processing mm -hmm. we are going to to show how to do that so the first thing like I said is loading the package if anyone is still having problems with the installation, installing, yeah. especially the bioconductor part, because we can, we definitely can stop and go. Like I can go on the chat to see specific yeah. cases. Um, he, here in the documentation, we discuss why we use Salmon as a as as Isabella already mentioned. At least Salmon in both Callisto. They have a method that they actually generate a, a, a Bayesian distribution. They use a Bayesian method to estimate the uncertainty of how a read can map to a transcript in the same genomic region. That usually the, the genomic alignment methods like STAR or other genome aligners, they usually don't give you that kind of estimate. Usually, if, if the, the traditional alignment methods try to separate transcripts just by the depth in specific exon regions. You and then quasi map, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then and then they uh, in, in the end, if if your transcripts share the same exons, it's exactly pretty hard to differentiate them. And then you can't really estimate like an abundance and uh, account uh, an expression level for a specific transcripts. Actually, you can, but uh, several studies in, in, in the few the last few years actually show that Salmon and Callisto, they have a better 
um, estimation of the expression of the abundance of RNA molecules when they when using a quasi mapping method and um, and the fish pond dark package that is the package where the swish method is implemented by by Michael Love. Remembering Michael Love is actually the same author of the D62 package. And D62 is, I think, in, is one of the definitely the, the most used RNA seq um, gene level expression, differential expression package together with EDGR. And actually, Michael Love team also collaborated a lot with the Salmon authors to optimize the methods and actually use the kind of information Salmon provides to get a better um, transcript level ex differential expression using Swish. And um, going to I, I, we, we haven't released it yet, the, this vignette on, on the website, but uh, I'm working right now exactly in having a, a vignette trying to um, to show the, the, those initial steps, mostly because those initial steps they they depend on on to, on steps that are not based on R. Most of the time, the pre-processing data, the pre-processing of RNA seq data is done on Linux on the command line. So some steps that we we are going to provide some documentation and more discussion around that, but we are not ready yet. Um, and also. We are going to use the gen code annotation of the human genome. Basically, gen code is a, an extension of the, it uses the ensemble as base, and they have a better annotation, um, a better evidence based annotation of isoforms with functionality of the isoforms, meaning they, they, are not, they, they have an annotation saying if it's a, if it's this transcript is known to be. And intro retention, if it's known to go on the NMD pathways for the for degradation. Um, and that annotation is based on long read sequencing. So it's yeah. way more like it's easier to trust than when you call splicing splicing events from short reads. Because on the long reads, when you get the full isoform, you can actually do this calling way easier. Yeah. It's good to remember that uh, um, what I was going to say. Um, oh yeah, for, uh, yeah. The, actually, there are several other uh, projects that try to do functional annotation of the mammalian transcriptome, like the phantom project, even ensemble itself, and for other organisms. But we, we highly recommend using Gen Code if you just want to get a data set that is easier to get information, mostly because, especially when we go to the functional interpretation, the functional analysis that we are going to show after, if, if you use annotation that that, are, that have a lot of, uh, I'm gonna say predicted genes or not, or genes without biological functional information, you, you, you definitely can do the, continue the analysis, but on the functional part, you lose a lot of interpretability, so. And we are going to also show what's the format that the, the data should be. So basically, actually, you, you could use any organism, any, any annotation, but you would need to add another layer of information to be able to run the analysis. So yeah, like uh, pretty much uh, the biggest problem is like the good thing about human and mice is that this is already done for us, the annotation of the genome. And if, even if compared, human is way better than mice. And like we decided to do this package pretty much because the difference between a gene level is because when you do a differential expression analysis at gene level, you're going to have like 500 differential expressed genes. And you do it at transcript level, you're going to have 3,000 different expressed transcripts. So like you're, you're just like, in, they you increase the amount of work it takes to interpret that data. And that package is precisely for that. Yeah. Um... First, I'm going to show where the data we are going to use is actually storage. Uh, for every R package, you, you can actually make available some data sets or files together with the package installation. So 
I'm going to show that you usually where you can find that information. Here I'm using a, a function from the FS package, but there is also a, a function from Bazar that does the same. This system, path system. Yeah, no, no, but uh, this is a package, a function from the FS package that if if you put the, the name of the package you want to, to see, it will show where in your Ecto system the package is installed, for example. I'm using a Mac system, a Mac OS, so that is saying that my R is configured to, to install in that, especially because this is my my development version. It's showing the, the package, the, the directory where I, I'm using it. But um, when you install it from GitHub, it will show the, the directory where your, your R was installed. And, and you, when you provide additional path, like in this example, it's actually loading this CSV file from a, uh, a directory inside the, the package. For example, if you print this XD data that's fixed, we, we have a table that is just a CSV file with the expression data. That is this. Oops, 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 oops. No. I lost it. Uh, basically, like I said, we have some files here on the directory that contains the data for this CSV file. Mm, we have to, yeah, it is just a, a from a separated value, like a table of the expression data. And if they re read CSV function, we can load the, that data frame. And that data frame, like I said, here we are starting from the um step after you do the differential expression analysis. So here we have a table of the transcript ID. This is the session. Yeah, so we are basically assuming that the user did a differential expression at transcript level, and that differential expression was done using the ensemble transcript ID. Because like the default, when you do Kalista or Salmon, you need to pass a reference for them to align to. And like the most used reference is gen code, and these are the transcript IDs that you would get from gen code. Oh yeah, that is good to remember. Yeah, if you follow the the salmon with the or Kalisto with the gen code annotation, you will get that by default. And, and use Swish or or DSIC two for the the follow up analysis. You will get exactly that table. Here uh, you uh, you probably just would need just to change the column. But if you have any differential analysis, you can give that same information just changing the name of the of the columns. For example, if you have another annotation, you could try to map the the column names and try to get this format. And then you'll be able to follow. Here, as you as we can see, we have seven two thousand annotations for transcripts. And that, that that's, that's a, a, a lot a lot a lot higher number than when you do just the genome level. You, and this for, is already yeah. cutting the things with zero zero zero. So like uh, these are because like right now for human you have like two hundred thousand transcripts. So it's seventy two thousand out of two hundred thousand. Yeah, here we are showing yeah, just the one that can be detected in the the, the expression can be detected. Um and then the other thing we we need is the I remove the the other thing we need is the ecto annotation and the I remove the annotation or is it no no yeah it's the let's go one by one um, yeah I was going to show the the files that we have on that directory here we already provide one one data set for the transcripts one uh, one table in that case one table for the differentially expressed genes um but th that is also ways of inferring the differential expression genes from the if, from the the transcript level if you depend on the package you use and this is the actual expression table. 
if if we get the the normalized counts from each sample that we have. Um, this is an experiment that had twelve samples. Wait. Yeah, it's twelve samples after the outliers were removed. Yeah, but it's not half and half case and control. It's like seven cases, and it it's a bit more cases than control. For the for the analysis, you need a, a table describing the the case and control um, to have metadata about your samples. Usually, this is a table that. If you went, if you did differential expression analysis, you would already have that table somewhere. It's basically just a data frame describing this sample. You can give a name to that sample, change the name if you want, but that that name need to be the same, the same name that is in the columns of the expression table. So this this name should match need needs to match the names you use on the. Just, the, just one thing screen. also, the reference file needs to be the same reference that you use to align. Like we are using GenCode 33 here, but there's GenCode, uh, GenCode uh, 40. Oh, another annotation too. So like we don't do our, like what he asked Lucio was that we, if we compare the results from our tool with another, from another annotation tools at the same data. So like, we didn't do our own notation. What we did was using the gen code notation. But like I use this with chess and with Andres ID as well. The problem is like they have less transcripts annotated, like the less uh, types of transcripts annotated. So it's harder to interpret. But Vitaly, we didn't do our own annotation. What we did was the visualization of those results pretty much. Yeah. like. Isabella was saying, um, we try to compare with other notations, but yeah, what we see is that definitely the annotation you are going to use changes everything because it's uh, when you summarize the expression at the gene level, um, if, if you just have, if your annotation just contain one or two transcripts per gene, then your transcript level expression is going to be almost the same as the gene level. So you can't really distinguish um, the contribution of individual transcripts to, to the gene level expression. And um, I also tried, here we are showing the gene code, but I also did with the phantom annotation. The phantom annotation has actually a lot more transcripts because they, they incorporated uh, KGSeq data. KGSeq is a type of methodology that identify the transcript start site. And they, they call different transcript start sites as, as different transcripts. But at least at, at, at the functional level, we, we don't have information of exactly how that, that, that different annotation impacts the functional level. So here we, we kept with the, with the, with the gen code because it's easier to interpret, but definitely it can be done with whatever annotation and and also you can include yeah. your own annotation. There's just the preprint that is out from the encode version four that they do a very interesting transcript classification based on types of transcript. Is that something like we are thinking about incorporating? But the gen code is the more direct one if you just want a result. Exactly. If you just want to enhance the analysis you already done probably with, because it, it, it's a common problem that people do differential expression analysis, thinking about the protein levels. Most of the time, um, especially when we're thinking about diseases or, or clinical practice, you do any, most of the bioinformatics approach, the genomics approach, people go over it to actually think, to actually interpret things in, at the protein level, say that a, a mutation is causing a protein to be different, that the RNA-seq is going to tell you that a protein is is expressed in a different level, but actually, what most of the data we have until now says is that actually you can't really correlate that. And one way of trying to get a, a more precise um, correlation from the expression data to the pro, to to the RNA expression data to the protein expression data is actually separating what part of that transcription really comes from um, protein coding RNA molecules or 
or, or how non-coding isoforms could be impacting what's the contribution of of the non-coding transcriptome to to the protein transcriptome that that's the kind of analysis we want to to leverage here to help interpret the actual phenotype or the biological outcome clinical outcome that you you can see in your your data that right now most of the database most of the the, the work that have already have been done usually don't go that that deep and actually there is plenty of data already available from published studies that can be reinterpreted, reinterpreted in, in, a, in another level. And every day new annotation comes. So yeah, I hope, I hope we, we discussed a bit about that. So here um, also we included in the package a function to help you access that, that um, the, the down the down to, to download the, 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 yeah. the references we need so this download load reference in the in the package is actually yeah we have a documentation here that it, it it's right now if it, it only downloads from the gene code and but you can actually choose the the version you want to download and the, where it's going to save the data um we offer these three file formats, the GTF, the GFF, and the FASTA format. For the analysis we are going to describe here, you need both the FASTA and the GFF. Those files, they are usually like 50 or 60 megabytes. I already have them downloaded here, but if you execute that fun both of those functions, it will start downloading in your machine. The... And it would take a couple of minutes, so we can discuss like a, a little bit. Like normally, it takes like two minutes, three minutes. Yeah, but... it depends on 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 the internet. on the internet and everything. But it saves on this data hall directory inside the directory you are working. You can change the path using the oops using the output path argument. You just pass a directory to for it to save. But by default, it will create this data hall directly and save inside it. And then the other functions we are going to use, they they by default look inside that the directory also. So if you change that, then the following you steps that. you need to down, to change also. Um, we are working on trying to automate that step, but it's not ready yet to use the the TXCI meta and other packages to automatically identify the annotation. But but science, especially if you use the if, if you use it salmon to to get the transcript expression, you will already have those files because you you need you need those files to, to do the salmon the salmon to, to 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 do to do the alignment. To, yeah, to actually pseudo align, you need those files. Yeah. So and if you yeah. look at the file, it's gonna be a mess there. <laughs> yeah, like remembering that this is a compressed compressed GZ file, but the actual FASTA file and the GFF file, they are in text format. So here I'm just showing what would looks like the in the first lines of that format. Because like I said, if you really want to use that with another you another organism of with annotation that it's not in that format you would need to change those files to at least generate the same the, the same format for you know the the gene code faster file it always uses that header in that format the, the transcript id the gene id in the ensemble format it also has some other annotations that we are not going to use but it also has the wait wait what is it the the transcript name and and the actual gene name following the human genome the Yugo project the human genome annotation the length of the gene and this is the, the actually the transcript the length of the transcript and this is actually one of the most important uh, informations we use in the following step that is actually gene code already uh, gives us a uh, an annotation of the type of transcript and, and that's the, the information we use in the in the following steps and actually Isabella made a really good figure trying to describe what those type of transcripts mean like I said most of the times they are the most important ones are the 
protein coding ones, usually is what people want to study. But we also have uh, what's called pros, um, we have pseudo genes that come that, that, that actually can be transcribed, but we, they, they, they sometimes are known to have different uh, biological function. Go yeah, first. like in human, the pseudogene is like, they are very low in the number of pseudogenes because mostly pseudogenes then are reclassified as processed transcripts or as protein coding. But like on other organisms, like mouse has a lot of pseudogenes. It like so in other organisms that the annotation is not as good, you're going to have a lot of pseudogenes. But like if we could like summarize, it would be the protein coding the process it and everything that's categorized as NMD. Yeah, remember that um, this is how the ensemble project defined those names. Um, so that depending on the annotation, you 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 could find all those things meaning those names meaning different things, um, and we also use. Yeah, yeah, and when we use that file, we also implemented a function, that function called make transcript. We we use the term TX all everywhere to refer to transcripts. So it's a it's actually a practice that came from from Michael Love on on TX import and TX meta package. That TX is a no official acronym for for transcript. So we have this TX make TX to gene table that actually gets this FASTA file and extract a, a conversion table from transcript to, to, to gene and, and also use, you also generate the, the metadata of the names and the, and the type. Um, actually, this, and this is, it's an important moment to talk about the, you're going to see that actually we, we try to use the actual transcript ID instead of the transcript name of the gene gene name over the analysis because you see that actually sometimes you find genes that are not, like different gene codes that are notated to the same gene transcripts that uh, genes that sometimes don't have uh, an official name yet things like that so usually if you convert directly to the gene name or the transcript name the Yugo names before doing the analysis, you are kind of biased that in the end, you don't really know which genomic region, which genomic locus you're talking about. It's a pretty common mistake. So yeah, like uh, j j just show them the table, I think is yeah. the best detect gene. Yeah, basically this function is going to generate the extract from the faster header, the, the relationship between, for example, this same, the same gene here, if you look at the, the first three lines is the, no, the first two lines is the ddx 11 l one or have like micro RNAs, um, long non coding RNAs. What is it? Oh, I did a head right here. Let me open the full table. Yeah, we have um, whatever gene you have in the human genome, you you find here, and, and all the transcripts related to them. Sometimes they for for some of the cases they don't have a uh some of the annotation but actually the only unique identifier for them is the transcript id and the gene id for the genes in the case and the part that we are interested on that we said is the transcript type it, like i said it comes from the how ensemble and gen code defines them but we, we are after this we will discuss how to use other annotations but here you have, if it's a protein coding transcript, remember, this is a transcript level annotation. If it's known to go over the nonsense mediated decay, if it's a retained intron, if it's a long non coding RNA, if it's a micro RNA. Some people ask me here on private message, like, how trustful is this that this is a retained intron itself? It's very hard to say that. What we know is that. On the long reads annotated by ensemble, these appeared as a retained intro. I, uh, me and Lucio have found small errors on the gene code annotation before, but we always report them and they always update the next, to the next gen code. So it's like a community effort to improve the transcriptome annotation. Yeah, all, all, all that effort is actually trying to give you some light around what, what could be going on on the cell. In uh, it's, it's not going to be the 
the definitive answer for anything. You, you always need more evidence after after those steps. And and like I said, actually, if you have a different annotation for, for those transcripts, you just need to change the table and provide change change the include other genes, other regions of your interest. It can be adapted in, in the workflow. But yeah, gene code is is the easiest to interpret right now. And I'm not saying that is the best, or it's going to save the 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 humankind doing that, but it's it's the one we can work on. And uh, at least in a streamlined way without changing annotation, without integrating. Um, well, we we are we, we actually work with other annotations. We try to integrate annotations when 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 we don't have information about specific genes. But yeah, and that's the that's the approach. Um, show the filter TX to gene on a view just so we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember that that table. I don't know if that you those have like all the two point two hundred thousand thirty transcripts. Also, I don't know if if you never use that in in Ari Studio, it's a really good function to show. That is the view function. It's with capital view. It will always open a, a data table in a format like a an Excel table, an Excel spreadsheet that you can manipulate here. So, uh, for example, if I want to find I don't know. B Fleet, B VG, F uh, F yeah. Fleet. It's VG. V no, it's actually Fleet. FLT1. Yeah. Fleet one. For example, here we have several transcripts for Fleet1, and all of them are annotated as transcript pr protein coding genes. But actually, if you look to what, pro for example, there's just one way of interpreting that. If you look to the actual proteins that they generate, they generate actually really different protein codes and we know actually that for fleet one the different proteins have different um phenotypes phen phenotypes associated with them for example they are exported outside the cell for example the atf3 transcription factor is a good example because it has no coding transcripts annotated for example uh, we know that it has like a longer and a smaller isoform that it's known to go to, it's a transcription factor. So it needs to go to the nucleus to have the transcription factor activity. But actually it's known that one of those uh, isoforms lack the, the subunit to interact with the, with the DNA and actually regulates negatively the pathway if, if it's one specific, even being a protein coding gene. Um, and oh, this is the BAF tree, but yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, I think it's fine, we can. Yeah, just to show in. And with that table, you can explore already some of the functional, uh, the, the types of transcript we have in the data set. Um, and then here we are going to, to with the files we, we were using, with the files they are in, already include in the, in the data. Here we just prepare the differential expressed gene table. Like I said, here we already have the information of the p-value, the log fold chain for, for, for some of those genes, for, for all of those genes. And um, yeah, and we, we basically, if you have another table with that information, you just have to change the, the names. And here we are also using the, the normalized counts for each of the, those transcripts. So we can plot, generate some plots over the um, of the actual transcripts in relationship to the gene. Um, in that, that that table is actually the most important one because this is the transcript level expression table. And here, and th this is actually already transformed to TPM is the normalized uh, expression. Because we are not going to do uh, most of the differential expression analysis. They that there is a good discussion around that. That they use actually the whole counts to to do the differential expression analysis. But here we, we are moving already beyond the the differential expression analysis and for plotting and visualizing the TPM transcripts per million is the best um, normalization method to compare different 
different uh, libraries, different samples, no, the same gene in different samples. And there is also a lot of, uh, each step is really well documented. And uh, we, we use the transcript to gene uh, annotation, the table that we generated to actually add those columns that we need to the to the to the to expression the from the, the expression data like we, what we're trying here is to construct the final tables with the dictionary information from gen code exactly exactly so like i said actually the, those steps we we haven't tried to create a function in the package that do does everything automatically because this is actually those are steps that are just data wrangling transformation of data you see that here we use extensively the the pipes and the tidyverse approach to and filtering. The select, a, lo a lot of select, a lot of left join. By the way, left join is the best function in our. <laughs> <laughs> so ba but, basically, yeah, yeah we are, we we work with the, the, our approach is keeping things on separate tables and and merging them when needed. So we have a table of the expression, table of the of the differential analysis and the table of the annotation and we merge them when they are needed um we, we had that discussion in the past in the past if you were trying to transfer to get everything fused in one single object and so people just press one button and run the analysis but uh, we also think that this step is actually crucial for you to understand the data so you you really understand that you have those annotations that you can change that annotation understand yeah what like, is being uh, being used we are a bit of old school and lucy was the one that taught me so like i kind of feel a little bad that now we all use packages that all do a s4 and a, like s4 objects and have a bunch of tables compacted with one another because mostly you don't even know what is there actually so yeah like i like to have separate tables for things yeah actually this is the approach opposite to what the bioconductor project Aims that usually the bioconductor project always try to get one data class, one object that contains all the data. We we are thinking on optimizing our, our workflow to to integrate all that, but we want to give the flexibility. If you have already tables, because it's really common by from exactly to people who have a lot of Excel spreadsheets on their computers, things like that. We also want to leverage that you can create the objects from just loose spreadsheets. Uh, and of course, implementing all the validation step so your your tables actually have the same information but we we are thinking on which um summarized experiment can, is that kind of um data class can can hold better that kind of data so yeah so he, here we are just filtering the 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 genes and and transcripts that we call differentially expressed Basically, here we are using a, a cutoff of using p-value and fold chain, uh, an alpha of 0.05 in the p-value, and at least a positive or negative one, an absolute one in the fold change. Yeah, this is basically for you to determine what you consider a differential express gene and what you consider a differential express transcript. You can change these values and be more or less stringent. But like I would recommend to be less stringent right now, so you can be more stringent in the end, so you have more output. Yes, exactly. And what's that? Yeah. And then in in, in the end, uh, like I said, here we are just working with the tables, and here you see that uh, no, not that one. What to do here? Uh, you're, oh, here that one. You're going to have the oh, we struck the names and yeah, yeah. Here, here we have the. All the transcripts that were no, here are just the different, yeah, the, the different expressed ones. No, not here. It's, it's not the next one. Oh, it's the next one, yeah. Here we, <laughs> here we, we add the information back of which genes were differential expressed to, to the transcript table. So we keep that information that is going to be useful on the. So this is basically the final table we're going to be used as input for almost everything that is a table with the transcript expression and the gene information and if that gene is differentially expressed or not. 
Yeah, well, well I, I just saw West comment here. Yeah, no, definitely there are advantages on, on S4 objects. And and well, like I said, we actually, we just, because we, we created this workflow based on, on the kind of output people will, will generate. And we started seeing that actually, because we, I'm going to say, we first went out, are we going to use um, PX import data, data um, the, um, play, the, the, the format that they output, or we are going to use uh, summarized experiment, that kind of thing. But then we saw that actually each package generated a different deviation of the summarized experiment object, and it was actually harder for us to, to, to keep everything track. And most of the time, people just have some tables that they generate. Oh, a collaborator sent me the table of differential express genes. And so we actually started from that, but we we really aim to be compliant, let's say, to what the bioconductor project. Yeah, in uh, a perfect every... world, we would have a function to convert one from the other. <laughs> yeah, that's the next step. And then then the one of the clear um when it's the benefits of using S4 objects is that you can do the validation, all the checking, all the data, in if they are in the right format, in the instantiation of the uh, of the class itself. So it's, this is definitely the the biggest advantage, and this is the one we want to like. Because right now we are assuming that you prepare the table in the right format. Let's say yeah. and we, we actually don't do much checks around it. I think, Lucy, we can ex execute the next, and then we do like a 10 minute break be before plotting the images. Mm. Just because, like, we are already like 12, 15, 12, 16. So we can do a 10, it's almost half of the work workflow. So the thing, like, right now, what we have, we have two most important tables the death table with the DAG information and the table of deaths that are not deaths. Yeah, um, it, it could, um, if, if, if anyone is finding it hard to follow until now, it's basically because right now we are just transforming tables and, and, and joining tables. So we have a big, uh, the tables that contain all the, all the information. If a gene is differential expressed at the gene level and, and also at the, of the transcript level, that kind of information. And in the next step, we are going to start plotting that information so we can visualize and extract functional information from that. So, yeah, so have... if you guys have any gene that you like, start thinking about them because we can try them on the next steps. Yeah, we are going to generate actual figures in the next step. And we are going to give a break until um, 10 or 15 minutes. Oh, no, I think 10 minutes is fine. We come back on 12.30. 12 12.30, 12 yeah, 12.30. 12 and... we, we come back on 12.30 just for everybody. Like, I'm going to stay here. So if you have any specific questions, you can ask me on chat just to give uh, Lucy a break and everybody else a break, all right? Yeah, I'll just, just get some water, but we will be around if you guys have any question or help installing or or like the NER, uh, NER problems, that, that kind of thing we, we definitely- Or if you want like... to discuss concepts because we are molecular biologists and the thing that we like the most is discussing names or things. Yeah. It's funny. I'm, I'm, I actually would be curious of asking how 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 is the audience. Uh, I saw, saw that some people already did, did RNA seq analysis or have a more science is an R conference. People have a more technical background in that point at least. But actually, I would be curious to see how how is the demography on how how many clinicians we have. How oh, many... I can do polls. I just need to leave and go, come back in according to ratio. So I'm just gonna leave and come back in, and ratio is gonna pass me the co-host again, so I can do the polls and we can find out. Okay. Well, you are, you are not as co-host. Oh, yes. Um, because one of the most interesting work at least I have been doing the last in the last year that I I actually come from a biotechnology degree and then I dive deep in bioinformatics in the last few years during grad school. But since last year I started working in a in a department of pathology in the wild cornell medical school. And what we mostly do is actually having to talk with clinicians and explain that so why we do some things in some ways in, in, in the molecular biology spectrum to to help clinicians drive better in the case of the Department of Pathology to 
generate better biomarkers or help define um, new categories for disease, things like that. So this is actually a work we are deeply interested on and, and that is one of the mo most beautiful languages for dealing with data and helping. helping All right, now I can do post. So we want to know who are our audiences. Let's try. <laughs> I will just grab your water. <laughs> My zoom disappeared. Hey, Rachel, I think I don't have the permission to create a new poll still. <laughs> oh, no. Let me see if I can make you host, if that works. No, I don't think it does. That's weird. I can't. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing also, but yeah. If you want to chat me what you want, um, I can create a poll here. All right. I'm going to chat to them. Thanks. Okay. No, no, you can go for a coffee right now. We're going to go back in eight minutes at 12 30. All right. Everybody, we're on a break. <laughs> I'm back. If you need to, to have a break, is um okay. Rachel, can you pass me co-host again? Oh no, no, it's fine. I have like the, the entire kit of things here. <laughs> uh, I made the poll that you asked, Lucio. Yeah. And most of our audience should be computer scientists. So oh. I guess that's why we are discussing a lot of concepts. Like I'm gonna be honest. 90% of the questions you ask, my answer is going to be depends. So <laughs> exactly that's <true>. biology. <laughs> but at least we, we want to 
make things that are actually really hard and be less hard, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> and show how data, especially data wrangling and merging of information can help. Some that, that data science skills can help. And oh, uh, that's good, good Joy. Good. I'm glad that we did a good job explaining. It's just that like, uh, we know that it's not something that everybody does. We know that most of the people that analyze RNA-seq are never gonna think at transcript level, and it's fine. It's just that if you want, especially like if you guys are computer science, it's like you, you guys know the power of public data. So if you wanna do a reanalysis at transcript level at X condition, I guarantee you that nobody did that before. And it, it's actually a, a, que, uh, what can say, a question of how, how the knowledge is evol evolving. Because actually, if you think on, um, um, if, you, if you think like in, in the last 20 years, the genomic revolution, since the first draft of the human genome, it came, uh, the, the, the promise of the human genome project was, and, and that's actually the heart of all of the bioinformatics is, um, we are going to know the genes, we are going to know the genome, and all the diseases are going to be solved, and all, the, all the phenotypes are going to be understood. And actually, how, how much more we explore and understand more about genes, about molecular biology, actually, we know, we, we know, yes. we discovered that we, yeah, we know nothing about that. We know nothing. Well, anyway, what, Wes exactly we oh, has yeah. a question. Do you want to ask? You can open your mic as well. Uh, yeah. Or you can type on chat, up to you. Can you hear my mic? Oh, yeah. yes, we can. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I think more and more people, especially at the biology level, are thinking transcript uh, because more and more people are analyzing their own data and whether it's, um, you know, single cell seq and they're using Alvin Fry or they're using, you know, uh, bulk seq and they're using salmon um, because star, the, the, the CPU requirements of STAR are just too high for most people who just are doing a one-off, right? If you're doing lots of stuff, okay, you, you, know, you set up a little EC2 instance or something on a cluster and, and you're good to go. Um, but I think pe more people are doing Salmon now because it can run on like a MacBook Pro. Um, and then, of course, the output from that is, is transcript quantification. So they, ha they always have to have a step to convert from transcript quantification to gene count level. And I think that's really making a lot more biologists more aware of, of that difference between a transcript and a gene count. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's really expanded in the last three years, the amount of people who like know the difference and, and stuff. I mean, I think there's still a lot of people who don't know what they can do with those differences, you know? Um, so I mean, another, another little plug, you, you talk about using DSeq2, which is Mike Love's package. I am a co-author on my, one of Mike Love's other packages, Fish Pond. Um, and so I did all the splicing, um, that function for load fry to do, um, RNA velocity analysis from the fish pond pack. You know, I have a very good, uh, story about that. It's because like, uh, I met Mike Love on the Cold Spring Harbor thing. And then I looked at him and like, your package saved my master because your package fish ponds literally saved my masters. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're really glad to have you here. So. Thank you. It's just that, like, uh, um, yeah, and, it, and, I and work, actually, yeah. this is a, is a good thing, a good approach, because well, uh, how can I say the well, when you move from gene level expression to transcript level expression, the main the main assumption on the differential expression analysis, like on 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 DC two, is that that you have a negative binomial distribution of of, of the count of reads. And actually, for transcripts, we don't really know that by and we 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 don't have we don't really have that that distribution for following all the transcripts of a gene. So actually, we have a better estimate um, using a non-parametric approach, like it's implemented in in, in the Swish method. Oh, actually, that's so interesting. That's a great point because yeah. there are multiple assumptions to the negative binomial model and one is of course assuming the vast majority of transcripts are non-differentially expressed exactly that, that's a great point i hadn't even thought about that because i've never done yeah. that. like the reason i'm here is to learn your stuff like i've never done this on bulk before yeah um, and 
one so thing that we noticed, like during my master, we worked with um, long non-coding RNA isoforms. And one thing I noticed is that fish pond captures way better the long non-coding RNA isoforms compared to all the other differential expression packages. Especially like if I compare to Edge R, DC, like I tried all of them. And like fish pond is the only one, the switch function was the only one that actually gave me some results, like some deeper results. Like we don't know if it, because of the biology, the way that they are expressed or if it's something else, but it's very cool. We are obviously we're very proud of our, our swish. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for that. It's going to I'll pass the word along to Mike. People are really enjoying it. Um, yeah, exactly. We, we, we actually met Mike uh, this November and we, we made sure to, <laughs> to, to, to tell him that yeah. we, we were looking yeah. for this. Yeah. The thing is like if Mike hadn't come to my poster, this package would never have existed the, the motivation to, to, <laughs> yeah, to, the to, motivation to do it would never exist but yeah like i think we can go back yeah. so now we are known the nicest part like at least for me the best part of my informatics is plotting pretty figures so we're in the nice part of. yeah remember that actually here we are not really discussing any new uh, statistical approach any new um you know, can I say computational methods for this stuff? We are always showing how to interpret data that most of the time is is already there, and and like was was did a great job show, saying that actually a lot of people is, is already using Salmon, Alevin, Fry, the kind of thing, and that 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 information is already there. And when you try to summarize that that information, that the, the transcript level expression back to Gene, you are you are, you are going one step back, not one step beyond, and and you can have a, a much deeper biology if you, if you go on that level. Yeah. So basically, with that table of the gene expression, um, the, the table that has bo both the, the gene and transcript level differential expression, we can generate some plots. For example, uh, we, we have this function implemented in the package that try to Let's do a basic bar plot showing if the transcript is is differentially expressed. Remembering that that definition of differential expressed don't comes from our method. It will depend on the method you use it uh, upstream. Like I said, we in that case we are showing that that was generated using Swish, and we in that figure we always plot here in the first column the the gene actually the the summarized gene expression and um okay so you you can see that we for example this 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 gene you can see a transcript that's up regulated and another transcript that is down regulated both of them are protein coding genes but it, when you do the gene level differential expressed expression um it, it, that gene would appear as not being differentially expressed. So you can always have the discussion of oh, one, one transcript is going up, the other is going down. So it should be considered as a, a zero expression or should you analyze them separated? And there is no easy answer for that. You ha always have to go back to the biology or try to do a functional yeah. analysis. In, in this case, these RBP is like... Uh... It's a sign layer on the notch pathway. The canonical transcript is the 201, the first one. So we see that the canonical transcript is not upregulated, but two non canonical transcripts are one is upregulated and other is downregulated. So if the notch pathway is important for the condition, in the case of preeclampsia, is, it would be a very important result. Exactly. Because sometimes you, if you just interpret the, the expression at the gene level, um, it's not that you, you are doing something wrong, but you are losing biology that can, can lead to other discoveries or other, um, because mo most of the time, especially if you concentrate on the protein coding genes, you can find the literature about specific isoforms, specific, um, especially here and not comparing the genomic context, but if they share different exons, if they if they have a different transcription start site, 
sometimes they can generate totally different proteins. So you, even just talking about the protein level, you can find, and, and sometimes if you also have experiments quanti quantifying protein, sometimes these, this approach would lead you to a better integration of that data. If, like let's say if, if this transcript generated a different protein from that one, you can correlate the, the actual one that was upregulated or not. Um, here we are showing that the, that function also can plot more than one gene at the same time. We have to fix the... Yeah, it's still not index. looking very good for the multiple thing, but... <laughs> but yeah, but uh, just we try to implement. But actually in the end, the, 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 that function is generating a ggplot object that you can, you can modify at will, for example. Here you could get this that plot that plot no it's not going to see the plot object and apply any any ggplot ggplot Things code, on top code of that you yeah I think I haven't loaded ggplot right for example library ggplot two uh, and then do a team. But like, uh, just like Joy commented about the publication tip to transcript level, the problem is convincing people that transcript level is important. We have like a series of arguments for the much that we go over. And exactly, turn the level, like it, there, it's still not like perfect, perfect, but it's some plot that is easy to manipulate on ggplot. And we are using ggplot for almost everything. So it's a very easy to manipulate plot on the end. But this is the most direct question. Like I have a question on chat. All right. There's never, there's no stupid questions, Joy. So let me see. Mm. Are the reads coming from specific tissue? Biologically, I'm guessing that the defer, defer across tissues. So with regard to public data, if we wanted to practice what you're teaching, we do want for looking for that to specific genes related from sequence for a particular tissue type. Yes, the problem is like finding the data with the depth to do this analysis is not an easy thing. So like you're completely right, there will be different different isoforms in different uh, tissues. And also like I think the new ENCODE paper explores it a lot. If you wanna look at the publication that explores it. So yes, like uh, how to find data to do that? I would go on SRA and check for high depth uh, bulk RNA sequencing in a condition that you're interested in. Yeah, like RGO, go directly to GO. Yeah, the um, how, how much more established established or pure your samples are, you probably will find a better consistency in what transcripts are expressed. And then, for example, if you're doing experiments with cell lines, with um, animal models that are genetic, that have the genetic, same genetic background, you would expect that the, the same isoforms are expressed in the same tissue. But if you are dealing with patient data, then yeah, most of the time, that, that's just going to be some, some va variance that comes from genetic diversity. But and and that that is where the the power or the number of samples you need to have or the depth of sequencing need to be to be improved because yeah especially dealing with human data it's pretty hard because the the patients are not genetically homogene or yeah like for this data set in specific it was very very hard to find one that actually had paired the patients well to do this. Yeah. But yeah, like let's move on because we have three dear graphs yeah. incoming. Yeah, let me I was just showing the fix here. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, there. Not this zero one. Zero one, yeah. yeah Perfect. So, okay. So like like saying it's actually the oh the like I said the, the package is still under development, but we at least try to make all the tables and figures in, in a format that you can just continue the exploration of the data after after that, that analysis. Um, here I'm, I'm going to show you another. Yeah, like post. this is a plot that like, uh, because here we see the isoforms itself, but we don't see the difference between conditions. We are plotting the fold change and not the TPMs by itself. But 
one thing it would be interested is actually to show the difference on counts between the conditions, RTPN between the conditions. So that's what Lucy is going to show now. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. And now here, here we are comparing like the, the actual the differential expression directly. This is the fold change, not the not the expression in each individual sample. And for example, well, another way of exploring the data after you already so you know, I found that for EGFR there is a transcript that is largely differential expressed, but is uh, but it's it's because I don't know it it's it says it's a low expression it's a genuine flower expression or what what would be contributing with that specific isoform being differentially expressed so uh, one way is actually see, uh, is exploring the the abundance in the trans the transcription and we create... just a second before before you do this plot like there's a good question from Wes like the so the negative binomial model assumes raw data coming in do you think that transcript level and how different transcripts are more transient or sensitive to each other might make the technical batch effects louder when compared with the experiments yep and that's a thing that we know we notice it a lot is that we have a lot of uh, experimental batch between the experiments like uh, for patient data you need to be very careful in, when selecting the data set especially because of that because if you if you focus you should do a transcript level analysis the the hands of the person doing and the things that are a problem but are not that big of a problem at gene level are going to show up more oh that's a pretty plot Oh yeah, the, this is basically just, just taking that that same information here, the from the EGFR gene, and trying to distill it in a more approachable way. For example, here we no no I'm not sure if the colors are matched. There, and I think no, I use no, different colors. No, we need to colors. match yeah. the colors. Yeah. Colors are not matched here, but here we try to plot the gene expression with the. Still have to think about which metrics we are using here. Here I'm just plotting the mean in the. In the the normalized mean, or we are using TPM in comparing the treatment against the control. Um, there so, are some genes that are very visual for that. Uh, let me think. Uh, but for example, here I yeah, just showed that. For example, here we we see like a one one transcript that, uh, for example, it has a, a a higher expression in the in the in the treatment, but actually it wasn't found in the control. So you you can't really say if it was increased or not. Sometimes it's just because it's a it's, it's a low expression gene and couldn't uh, transcript and could really be detected. Uh, but it, the, the biggest thing here is that actually you see a trend that is an overall increase in the expression of the gene, just that by some somewhat, somehow um, it really, uh, it, it didn't pass a, Cut, cut off or in yeah. the statistics. So it was because of the distribution. Because if you see here, the, the, this, the here, here I'm plotting the standard deviation around the mean of the TPM with those, the, the signs up and down. And uh, the transparent ones are, uh, uh, the translucent ones are the ones that didn't pass the differential expressed cutoff. So uh, you see that actually they, they spread here in the, in the treatment is bigger than the, than in the control. So or could it be that it wasn't detected as a differential expression just because of the variance in, in the treatment? In the patient, or, yeah. So treatment we're talking about preeclampsia, pretty much. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the, any, yeah. In that case, it's a disease. Yeah, it's not a, a fixed. Try treatment. NDRG1. NDRG1. G1. Yeah. So yeah, we are doing it live. Let's see. Didn't work. work. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, for this, example. this is a cool one because the retained intro isoforms are the ones that are very highly different. Those are the blue ones, yeah. yeah. They have a higher expression in general. So, yeah, if, if you see the actual values, like the, the ones that are close to zero, they they are probably, they, they are less, how can I say? Uh, it's harder to infer something because they are just low abundance trans gives you we are never really sure if we're not detecting them because of technical things that you couldn't go deep enough to detect them. But if you look for to the higher expressed ones, you see that there is actually a pretty interesting biology around that. You see processed transcripts, retained introns, and 
but actually some protein coding genes were, were differentially expressed. And at the gene level, using the traditional cutoffs of 005 in the p-value and in the, um, the fold change, we, it, it, it would just be a, a, not identified as, as, a, as a differentially expressed gene. And um, yeah, we, we, we could have brought a more biological explanation, but- I can like yeah, have I mean, a more the, biological explanation. That data set is a better work a lot on that. Yeah, the NDRG1 is a downstream signaler of the MIC pathway. It's related to stress response and especially is related to proliferation. One thing that is related to the preeclampsia pathophysiology a lot is that the, the placenta doesn't proliferate as much as it needs. Like the placentation is very bad during preeclampsia. And this stress signaler is being up expressed, but it's not the coding isoform that is highly, highly expressed. It's the non-coding one. So we see that if this guy was a cent central to the placentation, to the differential expression in the placenta, it's not producing the canonical protein and it's not acting on the canonical way. So this is actually one of the plots that we actually, the one of our most, how can I say that, that we use actually a lot to explain that concept because when we first explain the concept of the gene not being differential expressed, but some transcripts being differential expressed, it's actually hard to explain, hard to, to, to imagine what kind of data we are talking about. And actually here we see a really good trend of some transcripts are, if you, I'm, not, I'm not sure specific numbers, but you, you see that the variance on, on the, I'm gonna say, of the assigning of reads to that transcript are really good. And then you could always explore and I actually trying to do a mapping and see if on the genomic context you have different coverage on, on intron sites or, or, you know, or boundaries of exons. Um, and, but actually the, this is something that uh, the, the quasi mapping approaches, they, they, they do really well, exactly distinguish transcripts without the, the knowledge that those correct transcripts come from the, the same region. They, they, uh, how can I say, explain that? Yeah, they, they ju just see if those two, the, the, the two RNA sequences that I read would match better to one or the other without really knowing that they are the same X or, or so. And actually, if, if you use the, the bootstrapping methods, uh, the, like like Swish uses, it, the, the, using Gibbs sample, for example, in, in the Salmo implementation, they are really good in, in distinguishing the uncertainty around the, or, or how, how that read was, was assigned to a specific transcript that comes from the same region. Because in some cases, you, you're definitely not going to be able to differentiate them. And that's that's normal. That's part of the biology. And- um, If you wanna try another one, just for us to do two examples, try PAM. Let me generate another. PAM. PAM. Um, what, what is this gene pen? And two. The, this is a cool one. You see that is not differentially expressed at the gene level, but the fold mean to PM is very high. Like it's, it's, it's very high. And this like, there's a protein coding and a retrained intron isoforms that are differentially expressed. The nice thing about this gene is that it's not very explored in literature. <laughs> there's a lot of results of it on cancer. So I'm just like still thinking about it on the physiology of preeclampsia, but you see that uh, like it, he, I wanted this example, like, oh, you did your favorite genes? <laughs> oh, that's good. Like, that's how we, oh, yeah, we start collagen. doing like, yeah. Like if you have a favorite gene and you want us to try, just put on chat. Are you, like if you are you studying stroma or Estrogen cancer? The ca cancer, no, yeah. cancer, <laughs> matrix be... remodeling. Yeah, matrix remodeling cancer, because yeah, <laughs> collagen is always there. Yeah. Oops, I... So if you have a favorite gene and you want to try, it's just yeah. go This ahead. is a, a preeclampsia data set, but it, like I said, it, it's it's easy to adapt for other If it's a preeclampsia data set, it's going to have a lot of things related to cancer. 
<laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Preeclampsia is a disease that shares a lot of the process, like it's because you you see yeah, like the things like what they say is that the the, yeah. the the placentation is like a controlled cancer. Yeah, it's exactly. what they say. Exactly. The presentation is a controlled cancer. Crass. Try, try crass since I was asked. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, okay, 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 Raz, yeah, okay. Raz, okay, Raz. You're, you're working with immunological data sets, as, for sure. You have to 20. Hmm. Oh, no, we just have the one gene. transcript here. Transcript. Of what Nate, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 what I learned to work with immunologists is that like they like to name different transcripts, different genes. So most of their genes have only one transcript. <laughs> <laughs> It's the receptor. It's two R A L L E L R two A R two. I think yeah, we don't. Oh, we no, don't it's have not that on our, on our data, data set. Yeah, but anyway, you but can actually try this whatever. data is filtered, right? Yeah, I think we filter yeah. the data too. It needs to be differential expressed at least in one rate to. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it means that it's not differential expressed in, in any of the levels. <laughs> the levels yeah. But yeah, we we actually need to keep the table without the differential expressed too. To generate a graph, even if none of them. Uh... Yeah, like uh, Joy, what one thing that we are doing, and it's already ready for the profile plot, is for you to plot the entire list and save it on a folder. Yeah, I haven't really yeah showed the data, but yeah, basically the table we use to plot that, like I said, we we always try to keep the actual data that we use to plot. So we have that that information in a tab table here. Like you could filter that by if you want to. Filter gene name equals uh, K Raz and you. Oops, what I did? No, 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 no. Oops, I lost what I was. No, no, no. Here. You, you would see what is that? Oh, not the, the data, not the plot. You would see the, the where where yeah. that those values come from. For, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we see that actually you see an increase in the mean around the, the treatment, but the, the standard deviation increases also. So that's probably why it's it's not appearing in bo both at the transcript and, on, on, and at the... At, oh, did it, oh, yeah, yeah, this just have one transcript, right? Yeah. Yep. I have so, to check uh, why it's because it's not showing the, the transcript, but yeah. It's probably not because they no 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 transcript was differentially expressed, but yeah. Yep, it's pretty much that. So it uh, didn't get everything. So anyway, now we yeah, go let, to the part that on, the see. people like the most and that the bioinformaticians dislike the most. At least I don't know if you guys have the same opinion as me, but I really dislike transfunctional enrichment. <laughs> yeah, one common analysis done in gene expression data is what we call. The, uh, functional analysis. Functional analysis actually could can mean a, the totally different uh, approaches. Well, most of the time, you will see GC uh, or go go ontology, gene ontology analysis. People like to call them, but um, those approaches uh, are divided in two main approach. That is usually just the over representation analysis when you find a group of genes that are differential expressed and try to get a functional notation from them. And the less biased approaches, that is the gene set enrichment analysis, uh, less biased in the sense that you, you are not filtering which genes are differentially differential expressed before the analysis. Yeah, like you, you basically, that's why we need the full that table, because we're going to use them as background. FGC is one that uses very well the background. Yeah. Here we are using the FGC package, our package that is a implementation of the GC method. Of the GC method, the gene set enrichment analysis that comes from 2004, developed at the Broad Institute, and and it was in, in the R implementation is actually really good, really fast. They have everything written in C plus plus in the backend, and <laughs> the and and. And the kind of data we need for for doing the that analysis is actually an annotation of, for example, pathways. Um, uh, or like or you, you basically download the hackathon, download Geo, 
uh, this G and put on this format the GMT, or you can download directly this format from the MCDB website. Exactly. And like, depending yeah, if... on the data set that you want, uh, it's gonna give drastically different results. Uh, yeah, the, this is a, a really commonly used data set that uh, annotation that comes from the molecular signature database. It, it's it's also hosted by the the Broad Institute. Um, they have uh, to follow that 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 area uh, of cancers. For example, you you always see about like people talking about how mark gene sets or oncogenic signatures, and they have annotation already for genes in in those categories. We um, a lot of people use this C two data set that is the curated gene sets. They are basically gene sets that come from um, already published studies. So they have most of the time the the name of oh, no, this is not the C two. The name of the study that published that, like yeah, the, the C2 is the one that globates, that englobes everything. It's a very big one, but then yeah. you can go to the smallest ones. Exactly, yeah. And then it tries to integrate different databases like Biocarta, Reactome. And th this can basically be interpreted as biological pathways or pathways, yeah. Functional. When you say functional annotation, we are talking about. Yeah. It's like data. it's it's when the person on the lab asks you to do the geo or uh, that that's what you're talking about. Yeah, and then um, we, we included in the package already this annotation of the reactome subset of the of the C two molecular signature database. Yeah, it's like this is basically we got the C two and then we excluded the pack pathways that uh, superpose with one another. So what you, and uh, we did the filtered C2 data set pretty much. Right here. Um, and what is this? Like it's loading and it's a list with all the pathways and the genes per pathway. Yeah, just to show the, the first one, for example. If you, this is a list, the, the format, like I said, here we are giving already a, a one saved in the GMT format and show you how to transform that in, a, in an R list. But, um, but basically the, this object is a, is a list that the name of the, of each element of the list is the code, the name of the pathway and the elements of the vectors inside the list, are, uh, each element of the list is a vector of the names of the genes in the pathways, that a big part of that pathway. Yeah. And what FTSA uses as an input is actually the fold changes of each gene on our data set. So like uh, what uh, we did basically is to transform that GMT to be a transcript level GMT and separate the coding from the non-code, the, the productive from the unproductive. Yeah. And, um, and here we show, we, we actually created a function that is a wrapper around FGC to run the, run the enrichment. Uh, and like it, again, this can take what, some time. But yeah. yeah. What what is it doing? It is making a vector of, of like it's separating the table between productive and unproductive transcripts, and creating a vector of each of those transcripts ranked by their fold change. So you're gonna have two enrichments in the ends, or more than two if you choose to do by the different groups. One enrichment related to a type of transcript X. One enrichment related to type of transcript Y. Exactly. So what that function hand enrichment gives you, it needs your, your table of differential expression, the gene set list, and you can define a, a p-value cutoff. Um, and it will give you what is uh, a value that's common to be used in that kind of analysis. That is this NAS value is the normalized enrichment score and the p-value in the in FDR filtered p-value that 
that can be used to find what pathways are more uh, relevant. And we also, in, in what the function is doing, is separating what is the enrichment just for protein coding genes and for each category of, uh, of transcript that, that is annotated. Well, like I said, it, it's all dependent on the annotation we have. We try to do a work of, uh, let me find it. We try to separate in that enrichment table, the, um, wait, 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 not here, not here, where do we went? Unique, we, we try to, to give different, uh, we, we generate a, it's all in one table, but, it, but in, in that table, we, we have the specific enrichment for protein coding genes. We, we created this category that we call one productive. That is actually the summary of all the non-protein coding ones. But you can also specify the different kind of so you can have actually a functional enrichment of what the the pathways that are affected just by retained introns, just by genes that are known to go over the main nonsense mediated decay. Um, it all depends on the annotation you use and and also the functional annotation, but it could help drive some biology. And we have some examples here. For example, here we try to let me increase that because it's. Um, fig with yeah, fig in that case, height, yeah. yeah. I don't know, 18. Let's try. No, okay. should be great. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like this, yeah, yeah. The, this path, this part is the one that's going to get the most different because uh, each one is going to have their own package of pathways that they like and that kind of stuff. Yeah, here actually we, we haven't did a great job because we don't plot the name of the pathways. It's just yeah. like if you choose another GMT, it works. Yeah, exactly. This is just the name that uh, that is that we kept in, in our GMT file, the the actual uh, when you go over the 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 gene gene set list is exactly the name of the elements of the list. So you can have a table of, of conversion of the of the names here, um, just ahead of that. And you, you just have to change those names to, to the actual names of the pathways and could give a, a better overview. Yeah, those are the hacked on pathways and they all have a number specifically. Like that very first one is something related to nitric oxide that I remember by head. But uh, the, the interpretation of, of that plot is basically that you, you have all those pathways being affected um, by being actually positively affected by, by the protein coding. Um, yeah, like one, thing, one thing about this data set, and it's uh, common in preeclampsian cancer data sets, is that we see a lot of morph morphemes upregulated and downregulated. So all the pathways that the appear there have their their NS positive. So basically what Lucy was saying is that the interpretation is that like uh, the productive pathways are being upregulated on that ca those cases and the unproductive are being regulated in other cases. Yeah. That's it. And um, another example. No, this is the same. Yeah. That's, and like you said, in, all, all that is we are using just digiplot to Right, but actually that table have much more information over the which genes are actually causing in, in the GC experiment. The we have that concept of the leading edge genes that are the genes that actually are responsible for for, for leading the this enrichment score. And then you can also drive that uh, in that case the I can say the the transcripts, the isoforms that are causing this. Is this enrichment? Um, yeah. Um, anything else on the functional analysis? Yeah, this is actually the most the most powerful tool. Um, like I said, here we are not bringing any specific uh, annotation to do that. Uh, use the generic one, but you can try to use a more specific annotation for your your experiments. And here an example of showing just. Um, the separation of the non-coding, what you call the unproductive, um, the unproductive 
Yeah, like yeah. The path is regulated by unproductive transcripts. transcripts. Yeah, exactly. So and you see that we have way more retained intron, probably because we have way more retained intron transcripts on the data set in general. But like there are some pathways that are exclusive to like processed transcripts or to an MD. Yeah, and this again, if if you are doing that analysis because you are studying a disease that you know that. Um, nitric oxide, nitric oxide is is known to be affected in that disease. And then, if you look at just as at the gene level, you can find that it's being upregulated in the gene level. But actually, there is some biology that is also affected, affecting that same pathway in the non-coding or the unproductive. Yeah, like one isoform. one specific case, like NOS two, doesn't appear on this data set that. The gene level, but if you look at it on that transcript, it appears and it upregulates the nitric oxide pathway. Okay, this is a good example. So yeah, in, in the end, it can help you drive some biology, or like I said, actually find find novel biomarkers. For example, if you first study is related to finding biomarkers for a specific disease or biomarkers for specific phenotypes. This could help you show see that it's, it's not really just the gene or just the protein that could be a biomarker. The non-coding transcriptome, the non-coding isoforms can actually help you understand that, that biology and actually find no markers for, for that phenotype you study. Um, this is a part of the of the of the workflow that is exactly in, still in development. But we, we try to add some functionality to at least understand and visualize the, the, the contribution yeah, of the one, genomic context. Yeah. yeah, one problem that we had is that like, all right, this transcript is different from that transcript. So what is the difference? And then you need to go back, back all the way to assemble to see the difference. And then you need to download the assemble PDF and start messing with the images. So the idea was to try to plot the genomic context plot for the different isoforms in a way that you can see the difference between the introns and axons of that isoform. Oops, like that. But yeah, basically the... Uh, this looks better in the rendered version of the, but uh, for example, this is a, um, I think I left the, let me see if that, that example is better here. For example, this is the, this is an, a long non-coding RNA. That's why everything here is at the same color. But basically we, we brought this example because it's, it's really, really huge the difference between the, the, the those are plots of the exons and the and what could be the introns of of of, of that that isoform and actually you see that some of the isoforms don't don't even share exons so they could be actually interpreted as totally separated genes there they probably share very little biology from that to that and that this is just a way of visualizing that that information. And uh, let me see. I think I I added a, a protein coding one, an example just to just to help visualize that. Right now, the the function we we still want to add more information on actually showing which of them are the, the, the same. We, we want to have the same information that we have the on the on that plot also represented here. It's still working the way. So it, it will show which of those isoforms are differentially expressed and actually have a, um, a metric. Or yeah, a or rank them by which are and don't plot the others, something like yeah. that. This is a good one because yeah. they are very different also. Yeah, exactly. For example, the EG, EGF far gene is, is a gene that is known to be affected in in, in preeclampsia, and you can yeah, see it's that a proliferation, endothelial proliferation factor. Yeah, and you see that, for example, even the if you look just at the protein coding genes, they, uh, they, they, they don't share all, all the all the exons, or and the non coding ones share even less. The there is a just a way yeah. to try to explore that. 
yeah, Joy, and she said that they are very different from one another, and they are very, very different from another. You can't like say that they have the same function at all because they are so different. Yeah, we um, well, here we are using just the annotation for and the, the information from the annotation to plot, but like I said, we we actually want to include some more some more mm -hmm. so, some more functionality on that plot. And yeah, actually, you, you bring a really good discussion. So knowing that those genes have different transcripts that are totally different from one another, what is actually the functional uh, element of the genome? Is the gene? Is the transcript? Is, is the, the protein? Is the protein? So it actually, there, there is a lot of concepts that need to be yeah, he, he like worked the, around the around the gene concept. Mm -hmm. And like uh, the way that gene code uses the annotation is that if it's transcribed from the same region on the same uh, strand, genomic, yeah, yeah, on the same strand, it is a transcript from that gene. So even if it's a very small transcript, like that yellow one down there, or if it's a very big one, it has a big downstream region. These ones that have a downstream region are what people call dogs or like that have a region downstream of the gene. And like they are all considered the same isoform on the gene code annotation because they are transcribed from the same genomic location. Yeah. And, um, and, and like for the computational biologists, we didn't even enter on the uncanonical translation pathway. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, he, here you we are using just a, a uh, how can I say com common knowledge or what is already known in the literature, what's already in some database, but you could even go deeper and generate your annotation, really use a, a data-driven methodology to to find which transcripts are really detected in, in your in your uh, in your data set, doing a de novo annotation or um, um, a, a reference-based de novo annotation that actually uses known transcripts to to expand that. So actually, there, there are several methodologies that can enhance that, but usually, and they they are steps previous to to, to that analysis. How, how which group of transcripts are we using to 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 go downstream in the analysis is something that is not on the scope of the, that workflow. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the thing is like we have a generic concept that uh, is what codes for protein is the thing that starts on start codon has uh, exon exons and stops on the stop codon. But we know that today that there are other things that can code for other things. So yeah. Yeah, and here we have. Um, Link to, to some of the reference between the, like said, the, the methods we recommend or the methods at least we we use it to to find the approach the, the paper where where the the data set come came from is actually that one. So yeah. if you and like yeah. you are interested yeah. in the biology that is. That is yeah, like on the there. paper they don't explore much the differential expression because they are an RNA editing paper. That's why like the libraries are so deep. Yeah, and that's actually one example to show that if, if you are just a, uh, not just, but uh, if you are a data analyst, a bioinformatician, a data scientist, there is a plethora of information of data on public database because most of the times that kind of data set, it was, it comes from one paper that they, they most of the time already knew what they wanted to show. Like they, they have most of the time they have one gene that they are studying in the lab and they do that kind of experiment just to show that, oh, we we see that the gene X is upregulated, but they they don't really explore the whole data set. So actually, any any work can be re-explored, reanalyzed re to 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 go deeper in the biology and actually we do that. <laughs> that's yeah, that, that's like our job. 
It's yeah. because like me and Lucy are from a group in Brazil. Like in, in Brazil, nobody does sequencing. It's very expensive to sequence anything and it, in a good level. So our work is basically with public data. So I think to finalize, we can show our social networks, like follow us on Twitter and on LinkedIn. You can show yours first, Lucy. Yeah, please. Um, my name is Lucio Queiroz. So I can be can be found on LinkedIn and also on Twitter. I don't really know my Twitter account. Let's see. It's my Twitter account. It's Lucio Arqueiros. But yeah, I should, I should prepare a slide with that information. <laughs> but yeah, definitely can be found around social media. Um, we have a preprint that is under analysis right now that uses yeah. the, this approach to explore the the SARS-CoV-2, SARS -CoV the, the coronavirus um, expression of, of uh, immune, the immune response to, to SARS-CoV, especially like, focused on, on that unproductive splicing concept. Yeah, and like it's a thing that while doing this prepping to discover is that a lot of genes directly, a lot of virus directly interfere with the host splicing machinery. And COVID is one that does that, but like uh, herpes virus and uh, influenza also do that. They can directly interact with the spliceosome and affect splicing related genes. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the quality of the of the figures are not the best here, but yeah, we the, the preprint we already put like that. There are some specific group of functional pathways that we see an enrichment just on the unproductive genes. We see immune pathways that can be explored in that sense. And actually this paper is exactly, it's just a preprint right now, but it actually gave a lot of discussion on Twitter. We have 700 <laughs> comments on Twitter about around that paper. So at least it's, it's bringing, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's bringing some attention to, yeah. to, to, to that If work. you show like figure four, because it's a very good show of the mechanism four uh, or five, something. The, 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 this is the, the last supplementary, one. already know. This is, no, no, it's uh, the last one. This is three. It's a very big paper, I know. Yeah. No, the, the other, the, no, the next the, one. Yeah. This, this yeah. is our mechanism, projected mechanism that the SARS-CoV RNA enters the cell and it can directly interact with host splicing machinery. And like uh, there's like, we integrate the data, not just from RNA-seq, but also from immunoprecipitation and uh, proteomics data set. So we can see that the virus directly interact with some of the, of the host proteins. And these are the kind of information that you can only get if you do a transcript level analysis. Like the original authors from this data didn't get to that level yeah, and like I said, this is the analysis of already published data. So yeah, that's a lot of biology that can be un unraveled uh, mm -hmm. from from any many RNA experiment because the amount of data generated by RNA seq experiments it's it's really high. The one paper is never going to explore all the possibilities and, of one data set. That, yeah, and, and like yeah, not, not even diving in the single cell part of that because yeah. now the the first data sets. I think you can stop sharing and we can oh, discuss. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, that's true. Let me stop my screen share. Yeah, we are done with the with the okay. demonstration so we can discuss and answer questions and try to. Yeah, if you have any questions, discussions, or if you want to change gene names, <laughs> just yeah, let so us know. Bring, bring the discussion. Every, every time you see someone saying that they are going to do a differential gene expression to find new potential biomarkers or anything, mm -hmm. say that, oh, why, why don't you do that on the transcript level? <laughs> yeah, I don't do a transcript level. And every time someone says that you're going to do a QPCR to confirm, you do like a sad face. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like uh, pretty much uh, it, it was that. Like uh, if you want to see a smaller version with a more readier package, uh, we're going to be there at the Bioconductor. It's on the last day of the Bioxy 2023 20, 20, on Boston. 
and come to talk to us in person on Boston, like we love to chat on events. Yeah, and hope, hope we at least drove the uh, the you see the thirst for for knowing an, uh, other other categories of analysis to to look to our to gene expression data in a more broader vision mm -hmm. and don't don't really just accept that gene expression yeah. is is one simple thing that you just see like differential expressive genes and <laughs> the biology around that's actually much mm -hmm. much it's broader yeah. yeah it's very it's it, molecular biology is hard and there are a lot of questions still to be answered. So I thank you everybody for coming. We have like a lot of people. We started with 50 people and like we have like more than half. So it's great. <laughs> well, thanks everybody. If you want to follow more, like I have a compromise to finish this paper until the end of the year. So we're going to develop this package a lot on the next months. Yeah. It's still working. It just needs some small adjustments like the colors and the last plot. Yeah, we, we have some some more fun. We are, it's a project that we we have the the compromise to 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 develop more and, and generate more functionality over it. It's, mm -hmm. it's something that we, we really care because we basically use it ourselves. So yeah, we we are definitely going to work more on that. Yeah. So the easier it is to use, the easier for us it is also. So yeah. And thank everybody to be here. Yeah, exactly. And if you have any comment. Go on uh, social media, go on yeah, GitHub. You can and, tweet to me or yeah. go, on, go on GitHub and do suggestions also. Yeah. You know, like if you have problems, just go on GitHub and tell the problems. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. So, Rachel, I think we can finalize here. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, if we're all set, we can just go ahead and end the webinar. So, thank you both for your time today. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you. Have a great day. All right. Have a great day. See ya. I know.